beginner reptiles are beginner reptiles because they're easy and cheap, right? Not actually, because some of them are wildly expensive. And today we're gonna go over the top five most expensive beginner reptiles. My name's Adam, this is Diamond. You're watching Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles, <laughs> stick around. So let's be clear, we're talking about the most expensive beginner reptiles to house simply because uh, buying beginner reptiles generally isn't that expensive in the first place. Of course, these animals could be cheap to buy, most of them are, but some of them will actually be very expensive to buy as well, simply because, well, I mean, morphs, right? The genetics play a big role in how expensive the actual animal is. So with number five, for example, there's a bunch of different morphs out there. Some of them are gonna be $40 for a normal or wild type, and some of them are gonna be literally thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars so anyway, genetics are genetics. Let's not talk any more about that, except for right now. Now there's a little bit of talk about genetics in this video, and I kind of got wondering about my genetics. So I partnered with My Heritage for today's video. The objective is to figure out where I came from, figure out things about my heritage, and maybe find long lost relatives that I didn't even know were out there. And also it takes like two minutes, literally. One cheek swab, you throw it into a vial, put it in the packaging, send it back in the mail, wham bam, Bob's your uncle, Fran's your aunt, Maybe, you'll see in the results. And then you get your results back to figure out if Bob is your uncle and friends, your aunt. The ethnicity estimate is pretty cool. It's a percentage breakdown of your origins across 42 supported ethnicities and over 2,000 geographic regions. So like basically everywhere in the world, you can have an idea if you came from there. And one of my favorite things is the DNA matches. You can find people that might be related to you or at least share parts of your DNA based on this test. I've got a pretty good idea where my family's from, but uh, I got the results and let's take a look. Wow, okay, no, I was not expecting that. So you're gonna learn a whole bunch of stuff about yourself that you might not have known before. I didn't know that I was 2.1% Italian. There's no Italian in my family. I can't suntan any time of the year. I get sunburns in March. Well, I guess that's explained by the 65% Irish, Scottish, and Welsh, so. That makes sense. So it turns out I'm all sorts of European, which is pretty cool because I've got some European trips that I'd like to do at the end of this year, and because I can figure out maybe some family members that I might not have known that I have before, maybe I can reconnect with them thanks to my heritage. And the big thing for me is you're not sending your DNA into the government. They do not share your DNA anywhere. And your privacy is paramount, and that's another reason why I chose my heritage. So if you'd like to see your background in a little bit better detail, go to the link below and use the discount code. You'll get free shipping and as an added bonus, you can start a 30 day free trial of My Heritage Best Subscription for Family History Research. And enjoy a 50% discount if you decide to continue. All right, all right, so number five. BCIs and BCCs, we're talking about boa constrictors. If you get a BI, boa emperor, or boa constrictor, it does not matter. They're gonna get seven foot, eight foot, nine, 10, 12 feet sometimes, even bigger, maybe. Now, generally, you're gonna see them right around the eight foot mark, maybe a little bit on either end. I guess I should clarify because technically a hog island boa, which only gets to five feet, is a BI, and they'd make a fantastic pet. And the reason that they would make a fantastic pet for beginners and maybe a larger version isn't is because they're bigger. They're just bigger, which means they're gonna cost more, which is the whole point of the video. You're gonna need to keep these things in likely an eight foot long enclosure if you really wanna give them the best life possible, which I do. I keep mine in an eight foot enclosure that is four feet deep and three feet tall. No, this enclosure was not given to me for free. I purchased it with my own money. So there is no excuse. Oh, well, of course the guy who got it for free. I didn't, I didn't get it for free. I paid for it and you should too, or make one. Because if you go to a PVC manufacturer, like cages, for example, where you can go in the description below, use the discount code, you get some money off, or you can go ahead and make one, which is gonna be cheaper in the long run, I, I imagine, depending on the price of lumber. But either way, it's gonna be a task and it's gonna be expensive in order to heat this enclosure too, at least initially, because an eight foot enclosure that's three feet high, because by the way, they are arboreal or semi-arboreal snakes, so they're gonna be uh, needing area to climb. You can't keep it in a foot tall enclosure, just not a thing that you can do. So you're gonna need area for it to climb, things for it to climb on, lots of substrate, which is gonna be expensive if you keep switching it out or you, even if you have like say three bricks of substrate, I think it was four bricks of substrate, that's 40 bucks just for substrate, right? And that's if you buy it in bulk. If you buy it from a pet store, that's hundreds of dollars in substrate, 
the wood to make the climbing apparatus jungle gym thing. That was like another, I don't know, 40 bucks. The heat panels were 120 bucks each. You gotta power those things. The light strip, if you use UVB, which you don't really need to, but I mean, they might enjoy it. I personally don't. But either way, the enclosure is gonna be the main thing. Doesn't cost a lot to feed them. They're gonna eat maybe every three, four, five, six weeks, depending on the size of the animal. Some people go even longer than that. In terms of a water bowl, you can get a basin that you buy, like a tub, basically, that's, you know, 10 or 15 bucks from Walmart. It doesn't have to be super expensive, but of course, you could make it as expensive as you want. It just, you can't make it as cheap as you want. It's not really an option with this animal. Number four, panther chameleons. This could go for veiled chameleons or Jackson's chameleons as well, but I just think panther chameleons are probably the most common, or in my opinion, just the most beautiful of the beginner level reptiles. And the reason that they're not beginner reptiles is because, well, they're expensive to set up. The entire point of the video, right? These guys, I think, well, if you set them up correctly, so a four foot tall by two foot by two foot enclosure might not be expensive, but then you gotta put a bunch of plants in there and you gotta put a misting system. Otherwise you're gonna be there two or three times a day misting by hand and who has time for that, you know? I know people say, oh, well, it gives me time to bond with my animal. Yeah, sure, but there's gonna be a few days where you just wanna sit on the couch and you're gonna forget, right? Put it on a misting system and then set an alarm. The mister goes off at this time and you can go look. I mean, let's not be silly gooses. On top of that, let's talk about the vet bills because I promise you, if you get a veiled chameleon or a panther chameleon, you will be making vet visits. Promise. I don't know a single person who has had one for three years plus who hasn't gone to the vet. They've either not gone to the vet and have dead chameleons or they have chameleons that are thriving past three years and they've been to a vet, period. That's just it, it's going to happen. You're gonna need to go to a vet with these animals because they are more fragile, or at least they're more difficult to take care of than most other animals. And certainly past a beginner level stage in my opinion. If you disagree, whatever. I mean, it is an opinion thing. Some people dedicate their whole lives to chameleons and they think that they're great and they're just right for them. But these are 1% of the population of reptile keepers. It's just not a real common thing to say that. On top of that, time constraint. I mean, if you really do want to mist your chameleon daily by hand, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but I mean, you got to go down and do that two or three times a day. You got to feed these things by hand, some of them, not all of them. A lot of chameleons will learn to eat out of a dish or like a modified dish, but some of them will only eat if they're tongue fed. That's something as well. And of course, changing up the uh, enclosure, changing the UVB, the UVB has to be changed every six months. That can get expensive. Overall, I don't think these are a beginner animal at all. And even if they were, they're definitely one of the most expensive ones that you'll find on a beginner reptile list. Number three, Chinese water dragons. Goodness gracious, I can't believe I still see these for $40 in pet stores. It makes me sick because these animals are gonna get big. These animals are not going to be a foot long, cute little thing, no. These animals need a big enclosure. They need height because they're semi-arboreal and they need room to swim. Not soak, but swim. So these animals need a much larger enclosure than most animals their size, period. I will die on this hill. They need huge enclosures. If you don't believe me, go to an expert in Alex's Agamemnon's or somewhere like that, and they will teach you how to take care of these things correctly because I don't have one. The reason I don't have one is because I don't have the space for an animal that I'm really not that interested in keeping myself. They're amazing, sure, but I'm not interested in making a seven foot enclosure that's six feet high or whatever. I mean, maybe this is overkill, but you get the idea, right? Something really big that takes up a lot of room when I could have animals I'm more interested in, hognose snakes, corn snakes even, African fat-tailed geckos, Fiji banded iguanas, and I can have all that stuff in the same footprint or the same area that I could have one Chinese water dragon. So that is why I personally do not keep them and why I think that they are not a beginner species. Most people can't regulate temperature, humidity, and water for an area that big. And these animals aren't the most handleable thing in the world. I mean, this is getting outside of the scope of cost, but an enclosure is gonna cost you thousands of dollars if you buy one, at least hundreds to make one. It's gonna be quite a bit to learn and uh, pay for the filtration system for the water, plus all the branches and stuff. <sighs> They're not the hardest things to take care of once it's set up like that, but it's not gonna be cheap, period. Number two, an obvious one that you might not have thought about, sulcata tortoises. I can't believe the third biggest tortoise in the world, I mean, arguably, 
is always on a beginner list. Like I get it, in the US these things cost, they'll pay you to take them in some cases, right? They're free everywhere. If you live in Arizona, you see them at rescues all the freaking time, right? I mean, in some places in the north, they might be more expensive. Here in Canada, they're, you know, a couple hundred bucks to buy. But either way, no matter how you slice it, a big tortoise that's gonna be 100 pounds plus, Good luck keeping it inside, first of all. So if you do keep it inside, then you're gonna have to build quite the enclosure for it. You're gonna have a lot of heat and UVB elements because it needs heat and UVB, and it needs a huge space to roam. And even if you do keep it outside, well, I mean, this is very little of you because most of you don't live in a climate where you can keep your sulcata tortoise outside year round. And I know I'm gonna get comments, well, I do, sure, you do, but most people don't, period. Most people live above the area where you can keep them outside all year. Even places in Florida will take their sulcatas in, although Florida, maybe not the best place. You get what I'm saying, right? People in climates that are warmer will take them in when it gets too cold. So if you're someone that lives in a place like me where eight months or at least seven months of the year, it's too cold to have them outside, where are you gonna put them? You're gonna have to build something wildly expensive. They aren't the cheapest thing to feed if you live in a place where it's expensive to buy their food. If you're not getting, you know, the grocery stores handing you the leftovers or a livestock supply place with a really good deal on food, you're just gonna be, they eat a lot. I mean, it's a big, big tortoise to eat a lot. And of course they're gonna ruin whatever grass that you put them on if you have a place in your yard. So no matter how you slice it, they're not for beginners and they're super duper expensive even if they cost you nothing, like literally nothing to buy. And number one, green iguanas. Now I thought we were past the point where we were talking about these as beginner reptiles, right? I'm a 90s kid, all the time in the pet stores, that's what you saw, you know, iguanas. Yeah, go home and stick it a 20 gallon, eh? No, that's not something you can do. These animals get up to five feet, so they need a big enclosure because again, they're an arboreal species. When you find them in Florida or their natural environments in Central South America, you're gonna find them mostly in trees. Sure, they do come on the ground, but they need areas to climb. And because it's a five foot lizard, you need to give them pretty high places to climb. And because it's a five foot lizard, it needs to be pretty wide. And because it's a five foot lizard, it needs to be pretty deep. So you need a big enclosure that's gonna hold humidity. So bird cages generally don't work unless it's very humid in that spot in your house. And they're gonna need UVB and they're gonna need heat. Good luck. This is always more expensive to heat and regulate the atmosphere or the habitat in a larger enclosure than a smaller enclosure. These guys are gonna be expensive for you to house. Now, feeding them, they eat, well, vegetables and fruits. And anyway, this is not a care guide. They are herbivores. I don't know what groceries are like where you live, but I live in Canada where uh, grocery bills, we have to remortgage our houses in order to eat nowadays. And most of that is fresh produce. So finding a place that will maybe throw out produce and the last day it's good, will give it to you. Best of luck. I I've never had that opportunity, but I know some people do. I don't know how people can feed, especially if they have a ton of herbivores, for a reasonable price. And the same thing goes with these guys. Sure, it's not gonna put you at a house and home to feed one green iguana, but it might put you at a house and home to change the UVP and buy the enclosure and the whole thing. They're really cheap to buy. I'm talking like 25 bucks a lot of the time, but they're not cheap to house, period. What do you think is the most expensive beginner reptile? Let me know in the comment section below. And while you're down there, please hit the like button, leave a comment, hit subscribe, all that good stuff. I really appreciate it. And as always, a special thanks to the Patreon supporters. You guys get videos early, extra videos. You know about the really cool iguana that I have that's not a green iguana and a whole bunch of other stuff that is coming to the channel soon. For as little as a dollar a month, you can be part of that too. And that's it. Because I do videos on Mondays and Thursdays. That means I'll see you in the next one.